Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hillside Church today. Glad you're with us and uh, hope you found some good coffee and connection this morning here. And uh, we're just glad to be glad to be together. So again, thanks for choosing to come to Hillside Church today. So before we kind of jump into our Romans road trip series, we've been kind of starting off every message with like a road trip kind of story. And we've been inviting you to share uh, your road trip stories with us. So we've still got a few more that people have offered uh, that'll be queued up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but we need more. So if you've got a good road story that's like uh, family friendly that we can tell in church, uh, please email along to me and love to get you up here uh, uh, to tell your story in five minutes or less. Hint, hint. Five? You told me 20. I know. Just, okay. All right. So if you've got the, a good story, please email along to me and we'd love to hear that. So this morning we've got Mr. Andrew DeBoer with us and he's going to share a road trip story with us this morning, my friend. So the mic is All right. yours. All right. Um, so back in 2019, so our family had the rare opportunity. We had like triple the lifetime. So we went to Europe with our whole family. Uh, spent a couple of weeks there and just had an amazing, wonderful experience there. I could probably go on for 20 minutes, but apparently I had five, so I'll, I'll try barely, to keep doing the highlights. <laughs> um, right, so had a wonderful time there. Uh, without knowing it, we actually uh, happened upon the London, England Pride Parade. So found ourselves downtown with like a million of our new closest friends. It was quite the experience. Um, but we're really reminded, um, so I heard the phrase, so in North America, 200 years is old, and in Europe, 200 kilometers is far. So <laughs> it's true. Um, so at one point, we actually drove through four European countries in a day. We had breakfast in Holland and the Netherlands, drove through Belgium, stopped for lunch, afternoon snack in France, and then had dinner in England. Um, but it was a quite quick the experience. Uh, we also drove all of, over all of Holland. Uh, in one day. Uh, so that's both Yvonne and I, our ancestors are from there. So we saw where I saw where my father was born, saw where my mother was born, and actually heard stories about uh, she had an older sister who passed away before my mom was born, found the grave, and it's like, that's my aunt's grave. It was like, cool. Uh, it was quite the experience there. I uh, saw where Yvonne's mom was from, Zumaden, drove the Offslu Dyke, which is like a 32 kilometer dike across the North Sea, because the Dutch went, you know what this ocean needs? Land. Let's put some land there and made 1,100 square kilometers into fresh water. But all that pales because really what happened is this was the great European pencil hunt. So the background, uh, son Nathaniel had just started dating this young pretty lady and uh, Jen Jenna spent most of the trip getting, Jenna, please turn on the Wi-Fi so I can talk to Carol. Um, <laughs> right? And he asked her, hey, what do you want me to bring you back from Europe? So she said pencil. Clearly this young lady doesn't know De Boers because we don't do things by half measures. <laughs> Every place we went to, all the Boers are like, you know, the Louvre, doesn't matter, Mona Lisa, whatever, we're going to the gift shop, we're looking for a pencil, we've got to find a pencil for Carol, right? Uh, Dover Castle, pencil, right? No matter where we were, Flanders Field Museum, we're finding a pencil, we're looking for a pencil. The whole family, the entire trip, we're on a mission for pencils, <laughs> right? Now, I have to say, it actually turned out fairly well for us, because at the end of this trip, this young lady got a whole bouquet full of pencils, <laughs> And a couple of years later, they got married, and they should now the mother of our granddaughter. And I think there's a picture of them with the jar of pencils, which she still has. So, <laughs> so there is uh, the net result of the great European pencil. Good job. Hey, thank you, Andrew. All right. Thank you, my friend. All right, everyone. Lesson to learn there. If you go to Europe, the most interesting thing there are the pencils. Apparently. Thank you, Andrew, for that great, great story. So again, if you've got a good road trip story, love to hear it. Please send it along. So uh, this morning, we are going to be talking about comparisons. And uh, one of probably the worst, uh, one of the worst traps uh, that we set for, for people uh, is, is the comparison trap. And we, we probably do it more than we're aware. We, we do it actually all the time, comparing people to other people, comparing things to other things. Uh, we do it a lot, and it's not particularly helpful. Don't you just love it when someone uh, compares you to someone else, just compares you to your brother or to your sister, or you should be more like your brother, or, or, or things would be easier around here if you just acted uh, more like your sister. A and some of you are already cringing at me right now, shooting me like the dagger eyes and relax. I'm not talking directly about you. 
Well, maybe I am, but I'll leave that between uh, me and God. So, comparisons aren't altogether good, uh, but sometimes we do them just by nature of who we are. Uh, as some of you would know, uh, we just rolled back in from vacation uh, on Friday night. Uh, the bags are just unpacked, and we're readjusting. Uh, readjusting uh, to a 20-degree uh, temperature drop uh, was the first adjustment. Uh, fun, real fun. And already, I find myself comparing things, right? Temperatures here to temperatures there. Some of the things we do here, some of the things we did on, on vacation. And some things just can't be compared. You shouldn't compare them. Uh, but, much, but, we, but we do. And as I was thinking about the comparison, uh, much of my vacation life over the last year has been centered around ships. And ships, uh, indeed, in lots of cases, shouldn't be compared. Let me explain. Last summer, we took a, a, a ship from North Sydney, Nova Scotia, uh, to Port Basque, Newfoundland. And last week, we took a ship uh, from Miami, Florida, uh, to Turks and Caicos, <laughs> Half Moon Cay, Bahamas, and Nassau, Bahamas. And some things, even though you've experienced both, and they become part of your story, uh, they just shouldn't be uh, compared because some comparisons, some comparisons are just unfair. Uh, for instance, our, our ship ride from Nova Scotia uh, to Newfoundland uh, began with a situation where people are getting on board as fast as they can, getting out of their cars as fast as they can, like crazy people with blankets and pillows, and they're running like mad to try to get a chair where they can sit and watch TV and probably sleep in that chair all night. It's like the Hunger Games movie, if you've ever watched it. It's like run or die. Interesting. Our, our ship ride, however, from, uh, from Miami to the Caribbean islands starts with like a sail away party. And if Ivan and I are standing on the top deck, no one's going crazy trying to get chairs or place to sleep on the floor all night. Uh, we're looking out over sunny, hot Miami. People are dancing and doing the Macarena. I can do the Macarena for you if you'd like. <laughs> not a chance, not a chance, uh, but we have video of it. Uh, the scenery pulling out of Miami is stunning, and we're pulling out past the icon of the seas, which is the largest cruise ship on earth. That thing's amazing to just see. The drinks are flowing, the sun is shining, people are not living like they're the main stars on the Hunger Games. It's a good deal. So, compare the two. So we go back to our ship ride uh, from Nova Scotia to Newfoundland, unfolds with us eating the snacks that Yvonne brought to the ship. A few bags of chips, some salt and vinegar, a couple bags of ketchup, some Big Turk chocolate bars, if you're familiar with those, and always when we travel, there's some Sour Patch Kids hanging around. So for those of you that don't have kids and you don't know, Sour Patch Kids are like little tiny candy, okay? Uh, and some Diet Pepsi, uh, warm Diet Pepsi, I might add, and no food being consumed from uh, the cafeteria on this ship uh, because a clubhouse sandwich and fries is so expensive, it's probably best to like pay it out on a 12-month payment installment plan. So, so cheap Dollarama snacks, it is. Our ship ride from Miami to the islands uh, begins with food available 24 hours a day. Everything from uh, Guy Fieri's burger joint, Guy Fieri is the dude on the Food Channel, uh, his Pig and Anchor barbecue place, a Pizzeria del Capitano, to the Seafood Shack, to the local steakhouse, to 24-hour ice cream machines. Like, I did not see one Dollarama snack all week. Well, except for the Sour Patch Kids that Yvonne's always got in her handbag. Always got them around. But besides that, no Dollarama snacks. Uh, so compare those two. Our ship ride from Nova Scotia to Newfoundland on top deck has wind speeds of about 60 kilometers per hour to start. And even in the middle of summer, required that you hold on tight and pray that you don't get like a deep bone chill or worst case scenario, uh, your hair gets severely jacked up uh, like poor old Georgia here, and maybe you might get blown off the edge and end up in the mercy of the North Atlantic Ocean, which you don't want. That's the main deck on the ship to Newfoundland. Uh, our ship ride to Miami. Uh, from Miami to the islands on top deck uh, had wind speeds that were light enough that you could feel the breeze, uh, just gentle enough, just gentle enough to stop the mic from blowing off your face and to keep the sun from burning a hole through your skin. The top deck of that ship 
produce a situation where you could lie on the chairs, you could soak in the sun, you work on your tan, which I definitely need to be doing, you could watch a movie on the giant outdoor screen, you could try to eat your ice cream before it melts. Real problems. Real problems. And some things, whether they're kids or jobs or vacations, you just shouldn't compare them. Some things just can't be compared. These two things, you should not compare those. They just don't belong together. But when you hold one against the other and you realize that the comparison just doesn't work, at least it helps you to realize how different the things very are and how valuable, in some senses, one is over the other, even though in some cases here they both have value. But it helps you appreciate uh, the better thing a little more. As of late, around here over the last few months, we've been into a sermon series called Romans Road Trip, which is just that, to walk through the book of Romans. And we're going to touch on some of the major themes. We're not going to hit all the stuff. As you know, we're going to take some major jumps around. We're going to stop in some places for longer periods of time. And in other weeks, we're just going to catapult our way through, which today is one of those weeks. We're going to stop here and there, uh, pick our spots, take in the sights and the sounds, uh, maybe have an ice cream or two along the way, or at least a coffee or tea, whatever your pleasure is. So uh, those thanks to Jared last week for, uh, for jumping in. Uh, and teaching last week. So last Sunday when Jared was teaching, I was kind of looking at my clock, not thinking about you guys too much, uh, but thinking about you and knowing that when uh, Jared was teaching, I was on deck number nine, waiting for Bella and Georgia to bring me another burger and fries up to my son deck on deck number nine. Uh, so Jared, thanks for jumping in. I appreciate it. So regardless of where uh, Jared ended up last week, today we're going to jump ahead to Romans chapter five, as you've heard from Sarah uh, already. So, speaking about comparisons, and comparisons that are really stark, and sometimes unfair. A stark comparison is the basis of Romans chapter 5. And it's not comparison for comparison's sake. It's comparison uh, to help people see the differences. In this text, the difference of the power of sin versus the power of the gospel. And that's a very kind of like intangible kind of thing to get your head around. So the way Paul's going to do that, Paul's going to do that by using two people and comparing and contrasting two people to compare the power of sin versus the power of the gospel. And indeed, lots of ways, it's going to be a stark, unfair comparison, to be sure. So we're not comparing two ships. We're not comparing two vacations uh, or siblings of the same family. Well, maybe siblings, we can make an argument there. But we're going to show that the power of sin, and we talked about sin being a force a few weeks ago, not just a little mistake that I tripped up in today. It's a force. When compared to the power and the force of the gospel, Paul shows these two things to be non-comparable. And he personifies this, as I said, using two people. The person of Adam, as like the Adam in the Garden of Eden, that Adam, I'm assuming most of you would know who that is, and Jesus, the Jesus of the cross, the Jesus of the resurrection. So the comparison here, if you thought like the boat to Newfoundland and the boat to the, to the Caribbean were stark comparisons, this comparison will be much more stark, much more big and blown out. The comparison is meant to show, obviously, how much better and how much more amazing is the power of the gospel than the power of sin. This is an amazing chapter, and I'm excited to look at it this morning for a few moments with you. So I want to quickly just use some of the compare and contrast that come out of this passage that put Adam against Jesus, so to speak, and then at the end, I want to zone in on one theme before we end the message and celebrate communion together. So uh, this is a dense passage. I'm not going to attempt to get into all the weeds of it. I'm going to highlight the compares and contrasts. I'm going to hit one theme at the end, and we're going to have communion this morning as a church. So in, these, uh, in this passage, uh, chapter 5, the Apostle Paul highlights uh, the stark contrast between Adam's deeds and Christ's deeds, and then uh, the Apostle Paul compares the opposing results of these deeds. So actions that these two people did, and then comparing and contrasting the consequences of the actions 
that these people took. Everyone knows, right? You're old enough to know that every action has a... Yes, you know that for sure. Some of you know it more than others. So for those of you today that are like organizational people and you like charts and tables and stuff like that, uh, and you need to see stuff that way for it to make sense to you, this might be a good morning for you. And for the rest of you, uh, hopefully you'll come around by the time we get to the end, okay? So uh, this style of writing that we're looking at this morning uh, is actually uh, a writing style known in the ancient world uh, as a syncrasis, which is a, a basically a rhetorical way to write, to compare opposite people, uh, things that are compared usually in order to evaluate the relative worth of each one. So this is not a rhetorical style that was unknown uh, to the people of the day that Paul was writing to. So as we start down through verse 15, we're going to compare and contrast some stuff, okay? So hopefully this uh, will help you. In verse 15, we read, Adam's deed, his action, was the trespass. And the consequence of that action was that many people died. Interesting use of language here. So uh, the Apostle Paul says Adam's deed was the trespass, and the consequence of that is that many died. And we know that the trespass in view here was Adam sinning against God in the Garden of Eden by partaking of the fruit that he was told him and Eve were not supposed to eat. That trespass, that action, had a consequence of bringing death into the entire human race. So Adam's deed here has some dire, dire consequences. Paul sets the table with that. And then in verse 15, sticking in that verse, Paul now compares Adam to Christ. And Christ's deed was not the trespass, but the giving of a free gift, identified as grace. And the consequence of Christ's deed was not many people dying, but a free gift that overflows to many. We're going to come back to that at the end, because I love that too much to just go past it. Look at someone next to you and say, overflow. And the rest of you, you just do whatever it is you're doing. <laughs> In verse 16, we see that Adam's deed is identified as sin or sinning, uh, which brings the consequence that comes as judgment and condemnation, of course, to the entire race of humanity. And in verse number 16, Paul says that in contrast to the deed of sin and, and sinning, Christ's deed, again, as we see familiar language, is the giving of a free gift, and the consequence of that free gift is justification or acquittal. Quite the stark difference here. Uh, the word justification is a full-blown sermon on its own that I don't have time to get in today, but we will touch on it again later. Just think about, in Christ, it's just as if you'd never sinned. Think about it that way. We'll clear it up more as we go on. It's the polar opposite, basically, of condemnation. Look at it that way. It makes it simple. In verse number 17, as we continue to travel through these compare contrasts of Paul here, Paul says that Adam's deed is transgression, which brings about the consequence that death came to reign. Boy, even when you're on a cruise ship for a week, that's a heavy phrase to process. I've been thinking about that phrase a lot this week, even when I was supposed to be eating ice cream and consuming burgers and all that kind of stuff. Death came to reign. That's a big statement, man. That is, that's heavy. That is dense. This transgression of Adam, the consequence was death came to stay. Didn't make a pit stop. Not a temporary layover. Because of that action, death showed up and said, I'm here forever. This is a nice place. Came to rule and reign. What's it like to sit under the reign of someone? Try sitting under the reign of death. I hope you don't look at my tenure here like that. <laughs> Heavy consequence. Reign of death. Thankfully, the verse doesn't stop there. In the very same verse, Paul says that Christ's act is abundant grace. 
uh, a free gift of righteousness, another big word that we need to unpack as we go along, but not today, which results in, in the consequence of the gift of righteousness basically being made right before God because of who we are in Christ and life for all. So death came to reign in Adam's action. That's like, I'm here, I'm setting up shop, I'm parking here, this is a sweet spot, I'm going to hang out here, I'm staying, you ain't getting rid of me. And then through the action of Jesus, the deed of Christ, the abundant grace action of Christ brings righteousness, and now instead of death coming to reign, offers life for everyone. That's massive. That's a huge piece to process. Through the action of one person, Death shows up and says, you ain't getting me out of here. And through the action of the next person, life is extended to everyone. A sweet deal. One last look at this uh, syncresis, because I'm going to get lost in this. I love these, I love these, uh, I love these passages. One last look at here. Paul highlights the work of, of, of Adam again. Let me get my remote straight. Here we go. Verse 19, the deed of Adam was disobedience. We've heard the theme all the way through, right? Of course, disobedience towards who? God. And the consequence of that, many were made sinners. So I want to see if you're listening or not. Because I know some of you are. Lots of you people are. hope you all are. Many were made sinners. I don't like gamble and stuff like that. You know, I don't make enough money to gamble. But 10 bucks... George will pay it. <laughs> for the person that can finish this phrase, wait for me to stop before you finish it. Tangles, tangles, what tangles I was in. I was born in Tangle Town. Oh. Who said that? Hannah. You're a great listener. You're amazing. You're the model hillsider. Your face will be on the sign before the week is over. Because of Adam's sin. <laughs> because of Adam's sin. That was a Sunday school way of saying it in St. Anthony. This is Paul's way of saying it. Many were made sinners. Not a whole lot of choice in that, is there? One action. One man. Disobedience. Many were made sinners. Stink and tangle down. And then Paul, of course, not going to quit here. Synchrosis in, in Romans 5 doesn't work like that. Paul is going to keep going, thankfully. And now highlights the deed of Christ. And the deed of Christ was not disobedience. What do you think it was? It was obedience. Obedience to who? To go to the cross. To satisfy the sacrifice of God for the sins of the world. And what was the consequence of that action? Not that many were made sinners. But many are now made righteous. <laughs> I'm going to take that deal. The actions of people are important. Deeds always bring consequences. And in the synthesis of Romans 5, the synchrosis of Romans 5, we've got these actions that bring big consequences. And these consequences are not light. They're not easy. They're not just theological kind of things work out in your brain consequences. Not Sunday school lesson consequences. These are the things that have shaped our existence. Shaped our lives. Because of that, you struggle with some of the things you struggle with. This is a big story. There's lots going on here. Because of the disobedience of one man, many, we were made sinners. Could you imagine if the verse stopped there? That would suck. Because of Jesus, many were made righteous. I'm taking that one. Quite the compare and contrast, isn't it? In many senses. The, these, these comparisons, as you think about them, the themes. Disobedience versus obedience. Many died versus many getting life. Trespass versus a free gift. Condemnation for all versus acquittal for all. Many made sinners versus many made righteous. The point is this. Tangletown is a bad and a nasty place. 
And the mayor, Adam, has created a very challenging situation there. And Adam might be the mayor, but now Paul's introducing that Christ is the king. Christ is the king. So don't choose the mayor, choose the king. Choose Christ. It's a much better reign. It's not the reign of death that Adam brought through his choice. It's the reign of life that Jesus brings. And it's an amazing, amazing reign. So I had the challenge this week of trying to get my mind around this before I went on vacation. And how to summarize this. How to bring this down. What well, really hit my heart about this. What is the peace? There's always got to be a peace. And if not, it's kind of just a lecture. There's always got to be a peace. And I was asking God for it. This kind of stuff just happens. It's, it's there. It's, it's there. It's, it's kind of easier. But I need the peace. What is the peace? When I was getting my mind around it, one verse hit me. One phrase hit me. One word hit me. And here it comes. Let me read it again. I love this so much. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many die by the trespass of the one man, how much more... Oh, I love that. Did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? <laughs> overflow. Boy, that got in my gut last week. Overflow to the many. What does that word mean? When you visualize something that's overflowing, what do you see? You see water. You see being overwhelmed. Abundance. Paul establishes that sin is powerful. For sure, it's a force. And that force needed to be met with something that was not just equally sufficient to rescue people from sin. Not just a match that met another match. Paul established that sin and death came not to stop over. Remember, it was not like a, a transitory stopping in Fort Lauderdale to fly out the next morning. Did not for a visit, but to reign, but to dominate, but to rule. And the remedy, the gift, the grace that was going to come from God through Jesus didn't just, wasn't good enough to just be sufficient. Just didn't have to meet the power of the reign of sin, but in God's economy, it had to be bigger. It had to be more. It had to be completely and utterly powerful to completely and utterly destroy and overthrow the power of sin. And to do that, through Jesus, the grace of God just didn't come to many. It overflowed to many. The grace of God through Jesus just didn't trickle down to people. It overflowed to people. The grace of God through Jesus just didn't arrive to many, but abounded. It overflowed. It immersed the human race. The grace of God through, through Jesus didn't come like a trickle, but a mighty overflowing stream and overflow the banks of the power of sin and reached as many and as many and as many and as many who would ever want it. The power of sin, yeah, it's big. It's a force. But Paul showed that through the sin of Adam, he showed that. But we see here the deeds and consequences of Christ's action, the sacrifice on the cross, were ahead every step, every step, every step, ahead every step of the power of sin. Every, every step. It wasn't a last-ditch effort in the mind of God. I think I'll just come up with something to kind of match the power of sin here, see what we can do. God overwhelms it. The grace of God overflows it and reaches people where they are. It's this super abundant grace. It's bigger and deeper and wider and higher and longer and more powerful and more super abundant than the power of sin in Tangletown is ever going to be. That's the grace that reaches you. 
And I don't know, like, if you can remember pre that thing in your life where you were and didn't really understand the power of grace, but man, I know it. And I remember what, it like, what it's like to kind of be uh, chained down to Tangletown. And I never thought there was anything big enough to overflow to reach me. And I'm certain that many people that kicked around with me and hung around with me and knew me thought the same thing. What is it? What is this thing, Shane, that got to you? Was it the church? No. Was it like a preacher? No. Was it your dad who kind of dragged you into the church? No. It was the superpower of the abundance of the grace of God that overflowed the power of sin in the Tango Town and reached someone like me. No mental assent to a doctrine I can sign a form or no lifestyle modification that I can make on my own was going to get me out of the power of the reign of death that came to settle in that place. It was only the superabundant, overflowing, overwhelming, truly amazing grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, that could set my life straight. And boy, once you've experienced that grace, nothing else is the same. And I hope today you've experienced that for yourself. And it's not because it can't reach you. It is now overflowing to you. Not a one-time deal that stops. It's ongoing. The grace of God overflows. And today you look at where you are, you look at your life, and you look at people around you, you wonder, boy, how can this ever be? How can this ever come into a spot that's any good? How can God ever do something here? Because of the overflowing grace of God through the act of one man, Jesus, that can reach you where you are. And I went away this week, man, would overflow on my mind. Because it's what changed my life. And I know what it feels like, the act of the one man, Adam. I've lived that a long time as an adult. <laughs> to know how that feels. And I've also had the last 30 years of my life living under the power of the act of the other one man. Jesus Christ. Whose grace overflows into my life every single day that I live. And I'm going to choose that path. Because, boy, is it ever true. The gift is not like the trespass. For if the many die by the trespass of the one man, here's a phrase, and I, how much more? How much more? How much Did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Thank God for the overflow. It's the only reason you're here.